I want to thank everybody for coming out to the 58th Annual National Trappers Association National Convention and Sports Show. Our next presenter is Chip Davis. Chip is from North Central Mississippi and fell in love with trapping as a teenager in the mid 80s. Chip is a lifetime member of the Mississippi Trappers Association, lifetime member of the National Trappers Association, and a, and a, and a Mississippi representative for the NTA board, and also the owner of Expand which, Japan. Which camera is hot? This one? Take it away, Chip. All right, thanks, Trent. Um, hey, guys, I'm tickled to death to be with you here today. Thank you a bunch for coming out and, uh, and attending this. And, this is my first ever national demo. I've done several at, uh, at other shows and different things, but the uh, first ever national. I'm super excited to be with you guys. I appreciate it a bunch. Um, have to kind of bear with me. First time I've been mic'd up like this, I feel like a trapper air traffic controller maybe. So, uh, so yeah, Cessna 4650 Lamer, you're clear for landing. So, uh, All right, we're going to get right started off here. Uh, this demo is going to be on trap modification uh, mainly. We're going to go into several of the questions that I get on our big pans that we make. And uh, we get done with that, we're going to kind of go over a bunch of parts of the trap and what they mean and, and what their function is and some things that just took me a long time to learn myself and to figure out on my own and a lot of trial and error. And it's things just like this, guys, that you can learn so much. I mean, it took me four or five years to learn what a real function of a shock spring was, or a real function of a swivel, or something like that. We're going to cover some of those and maybe kind of cut that learn, learning curve down a little bit. So it's more focused on. So how many of you guys in here have been trapping for 20 years? All right. What about less than five years? All right. The less than five is more of my audience. The, o the older guys, I'm, please don't think I'm talking down to anybody. I'm trying to help the guys that hadn't quite figured this out. or The older guys and um, that I have... Huge respect for our learn from everybody here, but um, that's kind of what my whole motivation is here, is to really focus on the younger crowd and the, not necessarily the younger crowd, but the newer crowd to, to trap in. So, uh, so we're just going to jump right in here. I do make expander pans. <clears throat> they are oversized trap pans for, for most of the common traps that we make. We're making trap pans for 26 or 7 different models of traps right now. And basically what they are, they increase the surface area of your catch. And I'm just going to jump straight into the number one question I get at a booth, the number one question I get emails from, the number one question I get off my website. And that is, and I love it when I get these questions. I'm going to go ahead and set this trap real quick. The number one question I get more than anything, this thing's brand new, so I may have a little slack. There we go. Is you've got a great big pan here. Typically, as you all are aware, this, the pan is much smaller than this. It'll be more in the center, more of a circle like this, sometimes a rectangle, but we'll have a lot of unprotected area. The question I get is, if an animal triggers the trap out here, why do you not get a lot of marginal catches, i.e. toe catches, catching by one or two toes, marginal catches is kind of the term that I like to use for that. And there's a real reason that, you know, I love to get that question. Here's the reason I like to get it. The reason I like to get it, it proves the trapper is thinking. He's, he's, he's working through a process in his mind, and logic would have you to say, yes, if you trigger the, the trap right here on the very edge, then typically what will happen was you would typically, logic would have you think that you'd get a marginal catch. We started uh, building these things. I'll give you a little bit of the history real quick. I'm going to chase a rabbit real quick. We heard about these things uh, through Clint Locklear's radio program and several of the videos he had done. And later I got kind of became friends with Clint and, and, uh, and started quizzing him on it. And where did you find out about the big pan theory, the big pan idea? And he said, well, I learned it when I was taking instruction from Craig O'Gorman out, out west. Um, so I had actually a chance to visit with, uh, with Mr. Craig one time, and I had a chance to ask him a question. I said, Mr. Craig, I know that I learned about the big pants from Clint. Clint said he learned about it from you. So where did you learn about them? And Craig O'Gorman said, well, I learned about them in a publication I read some years ago in the 60s, and the publication was actually published in the late 1930s. It was older material that he referred me to. And at the Nationals in... Hamburg, New York, a couple of years ago, I actually ran across that same publication at a guy's table. He had some older literature there, and I was able to thumb through it 
And I was just amazed. I cannot believe to this day I didn't buy that piece of literature, but, but I did. And they were talking about the big pans. I found the, the section there they were talking about, and they referenced the idea from Hudson Bay Trading uh, Company back in the late 1800s. So the idea has been around a long, long, long time. I wish I could say, yeah, I came up with this, but I'm far not the guy that came up with it. But we do make them now, and, and, and we develop them. So kind of back on point, that's a little bit of the history of where they came from. So why don't we get marginal catches with big pans? Well, when we started doing it, we said we need to test these things for a couple of years before we go to market with something like this. So we started running them, and I changed all of my equipment over. Now, a little history about me. I'm typically a live market coyote guy. That's what we do almost exclusively. We do some, some jobs for some um, hunting clubs and some landowners where we'll actually focus on nest predators and different things. But primarily what I enjoy doing is live market coyotes. So when I describe this, a lot of what I'm going to be saying is the coyote steps here, the coyote does this, the coyote does that. Same thing for a mink, same thing for a raccoon, same thing for pretty much anything you're shooting at. But, uh, but so pardon me if I keep going back to coyote because that's just my history here. So what we, we found that particular year, the first year out of the gates, we wound up at this end of the season with 117 coyotes, and we had three marginal catches there. And I really started scratching my head because it didn't make sense to me at all either. Why are we not getting marginal catches, less than a 3% rate of marginal catches here? And about that same time, just incidentally, I had bought an iPhone, the first iPhone I had, and it came equipped with a slow motion camera. So we started filming this in slow motion to see what was happening. So the first thing that you need to understand is we found just through extensive testing, and I the one thing that I actually forgot was something to trigger this, and I still can't do it in slow motion. Um, and actually, I do see something. I'm going to show this to you real quick. Here we go. So this is my coyote's foot. We found through hundreds of test fires that that coyote's foot, and I'm talking about we'd, we would try to fire, we'd move a sixteenth closer, we'd move a sixteenth closer, and we did this repeated hundreds of times, we found that the animal's foot had to be at least 50% on the pan. We found that less than 50% of the pan, the jaw itself, would, would sustain the weight and we would not achieve trap fire until we were at least 50%. So that was the first thing that we learned. The next thing that we saw was two phenomena of physics happened at the exact same time, and imagine this in slow motion as this trap's firing. First thing, with any trap to ever fire, you've got to create pressure. That pressure, in turn, is the pressure's got to be after the fulcrum point. We're going to come back. It's real important because it's something that I want to point out here in just a second when we get more into the modifications and the anatomy of the actual trap itself. But that pressure is going to create leverage. The leverage is pressure aft or below the fulcrum point. The fulcrum point's always going to be either your pan bolt or your pivot point on the actual pan itself. And that's what achieves the leverage to push down, and that's what fires the trap. So when, when we do push pressure down to create the leverage, the jaw itself, and imagine this in slow motion, is forcing, I'm going to lay this down, and maybe the camera can see this slightly better than what I can orally demonstrate it. But as the trap is closing, here again, we're at least 50% on the pan, the trap is closing, it is forcing the animal's foot toward the center of the pan. Okay, so that's the first phenomena of physics that happens. He's, his foot is forced toward the center. The second is the inertia of these coil springs, which I primarily run. Same thing to a certain degree with long springs. But the inertia of, those, of the unwinding of the coil springs causes the trap to appear to jump out of the bed. It actually, the trap's still stationary. This is a result of the, the release of the inertia that's coiled up in these springs. And so what happens together the trap is, appears to be jumping at the same time the jaws are closing, and we wind up with a deeper, more centered catch, even though we triggered, the, uh, we triggered the trap to fire from way out here on the side. I do have slow motion video on my YouTube channel. I'll push, point you all to there. It's simply if you go to YouTube and you search uh, expand a pan. Uh, my whole channel will come up, and I've got dozens of free videos there that you guys can see. One of those free videos is exactly what we just got through describing to you guys of, about. You can see absolutely in slow motion the trap completely firing, and and the you know we fire it from way out in the corner and the deeper center catch. So that just took a lot of time and effort to 
uh, go through and to figure out exactly what was going on, and we felt like we learned a lot, and uh, that's the number one question I get at a lot of, you know, a lot of um, times when folks come to my booth, and so I really enjoy explaining that because we put so much effort and and um, and work into getting that kind of figured out, and and so uh, so I, so we like to to kind of point that out. So that's a that's a pretty neat thing. The next thing I want to go into is actual modifications of tra- or actual anatomy of trap. Certain things that some people realize, certain things that, that some people don't. And um, I really wish I hadn't thrown that trap because I need to set it right back immediately again. So. What I want to talk about, I, I explained just a second ago a little bit about pressure and leverage and fulcrums and talking about kind of some big words that we all heard when we were in high school. But I want to point out a couple of differences, and I'm not going to. These are traps that probably not a lot of folks are familiar with. This is Brandy with Tough Springs. And there's a couple of points right here that I want to point out. I'm going to let the camera kind of be my bird's eye view on a lot of this. I'm going to get my pointer here. That's a pen. We talked a little bit about fulcrum points and hinge points, where the trap pan bolt in most cases goes. In this particular trap, and I'm not knocking anybody's trap, the best trap to trap with, guys, is the one that you got right then. If, you know, the best time to trap is the time that you can go trap. You know, the best places to trap is wherever you can trap. So I'm not knocking anybody's equipment. I'm not, I'm not, you know, downgrading any manufacturer or anybody. I'm just pointing out a couple of things that may can, can help you a little bit. This particular trap right here, the fulcrum point or the, the pivot point is right here on this pan bolt. If the camera can see where, where I've got this ink pen, that is where the whole entire trap pan hinges. That's really, really important. Uh, uh, Something that's contrary to that, look at this trap, this pan bolt is way inside the jaws here. So let's just do a little bit of math, if I can find my handy dandy tape measure here. This particular trap, it basically measures six inches wide and we've got the whole entire six inches that can pivot up and down. Okay, this particular trap measures six inches but the pan bolt is an inch and three quarters down. So we are losing. So here's my point. If it takes pressure after the pan bolt to create leverage, then what, is, what happens above the pan bolt, north, if you will, of the pan bolt? I can stand an elephant right here. Even though I've got an expanded pan on here, anything that happens on the top side of this, of this fulcrum point or in most cases that fulcrum point becomes the pan bolt, anything that happens on the top side of there is actually counterproductive. If you, if you look at where the dog goes into the, uh, into the pan latch here, it's counterproductive for throwing that trap because it's on the wrong side of, of the fulcrum point. A lot of traps are like this, and that would be one thing if you're in the market for traps, I would look at this. In some cases that's fine, in some cases it doesn't make any difference, but for me, I like to be able to trigger the trap anywhere the animal steps on the pan whatsoever. So that's something I always like to point out because in most, nowadays, most of the modern guys have figured this out. They're, they're, pu- they're pulling these, these uh, pan bolts out. Probably the number one, or our best seller, the, probably one of the most popular traps in America right now is the MB550. Here's a brand new one. Courtesy of F&T, they were so kind to loan me this for this demo. f and I'm mean, not f and um, Minnesota brand's uh, MB550 does not carry a pan bolt. You notice it is hinging, the pan is hinging right here on the spring keeper itself of the trap. So that's pretty important. We can't, you know, we can't really manipulate that in any way, but, but they do a really good job there. I'm going to go ahead and set this trap too. The 550 does a really good job with the location of this because even though it is not past the jaws, our fulcrum point, our pivot point, is right here on the spring keeper. So the only thing we're giving up is literally probably an eighth of an inch right here. That's close enough. That's fine. No problem. Um, They've done a really, really good job with that. We kind of pay attention to that because that's one part of the anatomy of the trap itself that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, if, if, when you're in the market for traps, something just kind of to be, to be looking for. All right, um, I'm gonna take some questions here at the end, but kind of want to run down a trap real quick and um, 
Let's see where we are. We're in good shape on time. So uh, that was almost a disaster. So I want to run down. Uh, I'm actually going to start with a heavily modified trap right here. And we're just kind of going to run down some parts and what they do. Here again, if you've been around this business for a long time, some of this is probably going to be old school for you. So I apologize for that in advance. So let's start right here. Everybody knows what this is, right? Swivel. Most, most of your traps are going to have a swivel of some sort on it. At least most of your modern, newer kind of traps are going to. Uh, swivels are very important for a number of reasons. Uh, as the animal is after the catch and he twists and he fights the trap a little bit before he lays down, um, that's something that you want to be in, uh, that's important. You'll prevent the kinking of the chain. You'll prevent damage to the animal. You'll prevent, here again, in the live market game, like I do, we don't want any marks. We don't want anything at all, um, uh, damage of any sort that you can see or you cannot see. We're going to talk about that here in a second to that animal. We want him just like he was when he stepped in that trap because we're selling him to the hound market and, um, you know, for him to chase the, uh, the hounds after. And uh, they don't want any cuts, any, um, you know, uh, any marks, any broken bones, anything like that. So we go to extremes to make sure we're, we're as gentle and safe on those coats as we can. Uh, the next thing is a chain. Chain is equally important. Actually, even before the chain, we got a J-hook right here. A lot of guys, some guys do, some guys don't. Um, heavier animals like coyotes, uh, wolves, sometimes in certain parts of the country, big cats, sometimes a good idea to take a welder, spot weld these J-hooks. I have seen times that these J-hooks can pull out. Anybody got questions at the end, we're going to open this up. You can ask me about that. I'd be glad to answer it. Chain is a really, really important thing here. Um, I, it's a personal preference. There's a lot of reasons for doing a lot of different things. Some guys like short, short chains. Some guys like long chains. I like about 18 inches. It's just my personal preference uh, for my live mar market coats. I just kind of think that's what I, through my experiments, I've found that that's kind of where we get the, less, the least damage there. I'm also a big drag guy, so when I'm on drags, that's a little bit different situation. I don't have him staked down right here. He, he's got a lot more flexibility. I run eight foot of chain plus my 18 inches here. He's got about nine and a half to, to, to travel there, and that works really well for me. But, um, but, is, but the chain is real important. You want to make sure that you don't have super cheap chain, um, what I call dog chain. I think they've got a real name for it, inter, um, interlocking loops or something like that. The, just the really cheap stuff. If you're shooting at coats or great big cats, it may work great for a mink, may work great for a muskrat. Just be cautious because you can have some failures with a really, really light chain if you go to a really, really big animal. So that's something to kind of keep in mind and do. Next thing, we got another swivel. The swivel, especially in my game with live market, is we're going to talk about swivels a bunch because I want as many swivels as I can possibly have through here. So when he's twisting and he's turning and you know, he's, he's not doing anything except for the, you know, my equipment is compensating for me because the swivels are allowed to, to change. What's this next thing? Anybody know what this next thing is here coiled up? It, it is absolutely a shock spring. This happens to be one that uh, is made by J.C. Connor. In the live market game, the, the real reason a lot of people say, well, you don't get as much foot damage. I don't know how much we're actually fixing foot damage. That's not really the reason that I'm running shock springs on mine. Mine is more ligament tears, shoulder tears, muscle strains. I think that we, that we absolutely are eliminating some of those. When we give him a little bit of cushion to pull on, we're tiring him out a little bit quicker too is another big advantage. So that's the down and dirty quick overview of shock springs. Uh, I run them on all my live market coat stuff. Um, here again, if that coyote, if you're in an area that you're getting top dollar for the coyote, you're putting him up, He's going to get a 22. It's not as important as he is in a live market where I'm going to resell this coat for somebody to run. I'm looking for a niche market inside a niche market. The live market is absolutely the niche. I'm even wanting to go to a further niche inside there. If I sell a guy coats, I want my coats to run better and hold up better than anybody else that's selling them. So I go to stuff like this. Even though when he visually looks at that coat, there's no cuts, there's no broken bones, everything looks good. He can still have a ligament strain or a shoulder, or, you know, sh shoulder muscle tear or, or pull. So that's my answer for that. That's how we fight that is with the shock springs. Here again, going north, another swivel. We've already covered swivels, but uh, you can't have too many. Uh, another chain, I like number three chain on a heavy trap like this. Uh, holds up well. I like to get American-made chain. I do, in fact, have some import chain that works as, just as well, too. But just because I'm American, I'm proud of it, then I try to buy American as much as I possibly can. Another swivel here, 
and then a D-ring. D-ring is real important, and a lot of manufacturers put them a lot of different places. Um, just trying to see, that's a D-ring in the center base. D-ring is the same thing here with this other trap. Some, some anchor points will have, I mean, some traps will have anchor points or chain points on the ends. Some of them have on the, the cross. Some of them have, but most everybody is going to the D-ring type uh, of some form or fashion now. Some of them have the, the, I'm not exactly sure what they call them, but the, the longer, it looks like a really long and elongated chain link there. Uh, any of them are good. The biggest thing that I want to, that I want to think about there. One is, here again, back to my live market code, is he's pulling, I like for that to be in the center for there. Other animals, not as important for it to be in the center. We can be offset. You do get some torque when you're, when you're if you're anchoring out here on the side of the, the trap right here, you're anchoring the chain, you will have a little bit of torque action right here that can, that can become involved for, you know, for what I'm doing with the coyote. I like it uh, uh, centered up right there, and I like the swivel. But more importantly, when I'm bedding that trap, I want to make sure that that's not going to become an obstacle when I'm bedding. I really like to bed solid, and so when I do, I want to make sure that, that wherever my D-ring is, that's not going to be an obstacle that's going to get in my way. Usually, it's overcome by another two swipes of your hammer and get your bed just slightly a little bit deeper, but, um, but that is, um, that is a, real, uh, a real issue right there. Next is base plating. There's really two functions of base plating. You can see on this particular trap, we've got a real heavy base plate right here. Uh, we've got 3 16th uh, uh, base plate uh, that's heavy that adds weight to the trap. That's one function. The next thing, and probably the most important thing that base plating will accomplish you, is it will eliminate the flex in your trap, uh, the same direction that your jaws are going. You can imagine, you know, with a big animal like a big coat, if we're putting a lot of force right here, then this trap will have a natural tendency. You know, if I had a weak piece of metal or a piece of wood and I, I, I attached um, you know, a, a rope here and a rope here, pull, it's going to want to flex in the middle. So, so there's, you know, there's two reasons that we use base plating. One is to, to make that trap more rigid and to um, have it where you'll take the flex out of it. You know, the more you flex it, let's just talk about the worst case scenario. Say we had no base plate and we'd say we had a thin, what I call cross, but, but a thin... Um, metal that your jaws are attaching in, we get a lot of flex. Uh, you can, uh, and I've seen this happen, you can actually have jaws pop out. So that's, um, it's, any more with the traps we got now, most guys, most manufacturers are doing a really good job with that now. You don't see it as much now as you did 20 and 30 years ago when I first started trapping. So the manufacturers have caught up with that curve and they're, they're going past it. Most everybody's got some sort of base plate, but that's the function of the base plate right there. Um, Next thing, we got springs right here. Springs are real important. It's a big, long debate. I'm not going to get into the argument of there. A lot of guys two coil, a lot of guys four coil. It all depends on your application. I think, generally speaking, <clears throat> most guys set up a little bit on the heavy side of things. Um, I like four coils, especially like with this trap. It's got a big wide. We're going to talk about the jaws in a moment. But <clears throat> this particular trap has five-eighths jaws. So that means that we got, you know, an inch and a, a quarter of actual dirt, five-eighths plus five-eighths that we've got to push out of the, out of the dirt. <clears throat> we've got to move that soil out of our way to achieve closure of the jaws. So that's where the other springs come in to play at. And uh, the strength of the springs are important, but it's not as important as the leverage of the trap. We're going to cover that here in just a second when we get to levers, how high up they ride and what that means and the different little nuances of that. So um, there's 100 different spring tensions out there. There's 100 different configurations that you could do. Uh, most manufacturers have a good shotgun approach, but as you develop your own little thing, i.e. for me, <clears throat> it's live market coach, so I want to go to, to a four coil to get a big wide jaw face out of the ground quickly, um, but I also don't want to overdo it because I don't have so much pressure from my springs that I'm cutting on contact. So, uh, you know, if you're a mink guy, you probably not wanting to four coil. You're probably, you know, or even muskrat, you're wanting to uh, a little bit lighter trap, maybe a little bit lighter spring tension. You still want it fast, but you don't want it, you know, fast enough to close and, and the animal not react, which is, oh, we're going to go into that here in a second too. But, um, but you don't necessarily want to overdo it. I think most people go too heavy on, on springs and four coiling and spring, spring pressure itself. We're going to jump, I mentioned the levers. We're going to jump right up there. And there's a lot of difference in the levers now. I am going to throw this trap now. I'm going to point out a few, a few little differences. <clears throat> this trap is designed strictly for the live market. And if you'll notice 
how high up the levers are actually riding on this jaw. This happens to be a cuff, uh, a cavity cuff by Tom Bodette here that I'm using for the demo. These levers are riding extremely, extremely high. We were talking about springs a minute ago. I can't do that with a lot of modern traps. These springs are weaker by, by intent. They're fast, they're four coils, so I've got enough spring tension to get those big wide levers out of the ground, but it's light enough that when about 60% of this pressure is relieved by the time the levers ride 50% up the shank of the jaw. When I get right here, most of that pressure from the, the springs are done. Well, you say, well, if you got weaker springs, how are you, how's the, the next thing that we get for cuts with coyotes is a seesaw action right here, especially in sandier soils. The more that coat's uh, leg is allowed to go back and forth, the more we'll cut him. That's the second most uh, prevalent way that we cut coat's feet. Or have a, it's really not cuts more as much as it is abrasions that later become cuts and gives us trouble. So what we do is um, we're fixing that by leverage. By having these levers come so high up, I cannot move that at all. And the reason that we're not is not from the, the tension of the springs, it's from the leverage. Now, certainly the springs are holding pressure on the levers, but the higher we come up, the more locked down we are right here. So uh, hopefully that's making a little bit of sense. Uh, other traps, and here again, not knocking anybody's, is 550. They come up pretty high as well. You still got a lot of room here. That's, that's a great middle of the road uh, middle of the road design right there. They're not coming up too high, but they're not, they're not certainly not coming down too low. If you look at some stuff, say, manufactured in the mid 1960s, you'll run across some traps that are probably at closure, the levers are about halfway up the jaw shank right there. That's where you're, you're getting into, you got some, a uh, little bit of too much slack in, in your jaws at closure. Mo here again, most of the modern guys do a good job. This particular trap's done a good job with it. They're, they're, they're riding up pretty high. So a lot of guys have figured that out. Um, next thing, uh, we got a dog right here. We've got a hundred other com uh, configurations of dog versus dogless. We've got a you know, um, dogs with night latches. We've got dogless pans with night latches. We've got every configuration under the sun. So I'm just going to mention what my preference is. My preference is I really don't have a preference. I used to think that I really liked a dogless uh, trap design. That's before I was pretty involved in helping develop this particular trap. I'm not going to go into that, but, but um, this happens to be, I actually use these jaws in a different manufacturer's um, trap, took their jaws out, replaced, there was a dog type system, and I replaced, uh, cut the dog off, I made a dogless trap out of it, or made an expanded pan with a catch on the end of it, like similar to if you're familiar with the Bridger dogless design, it basically has a tab out. I didn't like that because on a cast jaw, it wasn't a smooth, it wasn't a smooth transition between the down pressure and the trap fire because I was riding on cast. Uh, I think if I was riding on steel, it'd be a little bit better achieved. So in that particular design, I like the dog, the, the dog a lot better. The disadvantage of the dog, you do have another thin piece of metal that's out here flopping after the catch. Occasionally, probably the most common thing that I have to work on on the trap line itself is a deformed dog from whatever reason. That coat gets in it and that's an easy thing to bite. It's a little bit thin. It can give a little bit. Once he gets anything to give, he's going to attack it even further. So it's probably the most common repair. You want to pay, if you do run dog traps, one a little piece of advice I'd tell you, even if you got to take a picture of it with your cell phone, know what the shape of that dog is. This dog is actually not bent. Well, it actually is bent, but it's bent for a reason. That's the shape of this particular dog. This dog on this trap is actually straight. That's how it's designed to be. So know what your dog's supposed to be because likely you may have to get two pair of pliers in the field and go back and, and recreate that shape at some point in time. If it gets bad enough, don't be afraid to replace the dog because the more they get bent, you get by straightening them several times, but the more they get bent, uh, the weaker they become. So uh, something to kind of tend to there. Advantage of a dog is you don't have that to worry about. Um, but here again, the disadvantages are smooth transition, like I mentioned a minute ago, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the next thing is jaws. There's also thousands of different configurations of jaws from outside laminations to steel jaws to inside laminations to cast jaws to you name it. There's anything under the sun, double jaw stuff out there, all kind of different configurations of jaws. Um, you know, here again, my particular game is live market coats. I like a big wide face. I like it rounded. I don't like anything sharp. Um, as far as uh, damage, foot damage, 
to anything we're cutting, most of the foot damage that we see occurs on the inside part of the jaws. If I had to pick, if I could have one lamination, I couldn't have but one, I'm going to laminate the inside every time. That's where you're closed. That's the business end. It's the first thing that's actually going to close around that animal's foot is the inside part of that jaw, what I'm touching right here. That's where I want rounded, um, and um, that's what I really want to pay attention to. Unfortunately, most people market and push outside laminations more than anything. Outside laminations are important. They add a lot of surface area to just to a typical steel jaw. <clears throat> this is a really good example <clears throat> of what a lot of guys are doing with a jaw. This is a steel jaw that is, I think that's 3 16 jaw there. And um, it's pretty sharp on the inside of this thing. You know, I could... Uh, you know, I can, I can feel the sharpness. It's not actually cutting me, but it is pretty sharp. If I close that at full speed and, and my fingers are right in the way, I'm probably going to be bleeding a little bit. Um, so if I had to make a lamination, I want to laminate on the inside. Obviously, I'm not sure if the camera can zoom this far or not, but where I would put my laminations are right here, right along the very, very inside. And uh, I like the, the biggest laminations I can get. Uh, all the way up to a quarter inch round steel and usually you don't have to spot weld them about three times there and I like to laminate both sides. There's really no, you're not achieving much by just putting one lamination on. Uh, you really need a lamination on both sides there. Uh, here again, you're softening up that sharp edge and you're adding surface area to the inside part of, the, of those jaws. Um, you know, the next thing I'll just briefly touch on, I'm going to probably get out of the box on this and say something that's not real popular is offset. There's you know, the number one thing above anything I say is check your local laws on anything you do. I happen to be from Mississippi. We've got two rules. We have to have a trapping license and we cannot catch the governor himself. Anything else is fair game. So, uh, so we don't have any kind of offset uh, jaw rules or anything else. I know lots of you guys that live in communist, I'm sorry, uh, northern uh, uh, areas actually do have uh, offset rules, they have size rules, you traps. Make sure you check that first, okay? Because uh, I don't want to tell you anything that's going to get you in trouble. Make sure you find out your own local laws yourself. But uh, offsets, in theory, when that trap closes around this animal's foot, it's offset. I can get circulation here, here, just the same. Let's just do something real quick. I've got my tape measure right here. That happens to be exactly one inch apart. There we go, right there. Exactly, if I can hold it still, exactly one inch. This is my simulated coyote's foot. Okay, that's an offset trap, right? See the offset in it. Let's take a, that's an offset trap too. Let's take a non-offset trap right here. Let's do the same little test. If I can do this without setting it. There we go. Let's see what we got. Should be exactly the same thing. Why is it the same thing? Because the diameter of the coyote's leg is the same thing. I'm getting circulation exactly like I was in an offset trap. I personally am not buying the whole idea of the offsets. And here again, I put a lot of thought on this because I want to keep that foot more so in the live market. I want to keep that foot as healthy as I possibly can. Um, so that's my beef with, now you'll see a lot of live, a lot of offset traps on the market. You will see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of that marketed. I personally don't see a huge benefit to having the offset versus a non-offset uh, trap. But here again, laws are, are a real reason for doing that. And um, yeah, that's probably the, the only reason I'm aware of as far as functionality and true reasoning why you would want offset versus non-offset. I guess maybe offsets maybe look a little cooler too. So, uh, so uh, at any rate, but um, I have I have really no. Actually, if I had a preference, I'd rather have a uh, solid closure jaw. So the last thing that I want to do, or, or one of the last things, and we're getting down. We got enough time to do this. I need some help. Who runs 550s in here? Anybody else run 550s? Looking for somebody young that runs 550s. We don't have many kids in here. No kids run 550s. All right, you'll do. Come on. When we were talking about, one more question I get a lot. We were talking about the, um, the marginal catches, right? The first of the little demo here. We were talking about marginal catches. And one question I get quite often 
is, well, when he triggers the pan from way out here and he feels the trap go down, he's, his foot's already on the outside, why does he not move his, move his foot out of the way? This is a really cool little deal that I want to demonstrate with a dozen MB550 pans. So how do you? 35. 35. I'm, I've got about 12 or 15 years on you. So, um, so uh, yeah, it's 48, so, you know, close enough. So uh, you're younger. You look like you're in a lot better shape than I am and all that. I want you to be my coat, so I want to do a little demonstration. And this is going to be your uh, free dozen of MB550 pans, but we're going to play a game, though. You've got to win them first. All right? Let me see your hand. You right-handed or you left-handed? Right. Right-handed. All right. I want you to hold your right hand right here, okay? Actually, that's not even fair. Let's move your hand right there, a little closer. All right? I'm going to have my hand right here. What I want you to do, I want you to grab your free dozen MB550 expander pans before I can grab them, and they're yours for free. Okay? All right? One rule. You cannot move your hand until you see mine move. You've got to let me move first because I'm a good 12 inches higher than you, right? All right, so you ready? All right, just, you can stare at my hand. Don't move yours until I move mine, okay? <laughs> oh, you can do better than that. Come on. All right, one more time. That isn't fair. Come on, there we go. All right, you ready? Wait a minute, let's go up higher here. I'll give him even more room. All right, don't move yours until I move mine. Okay, you ready? You can have them anyway. Guys, here's what's important about that. When that coyote steps on that pan, the reason I beat him twice and the reason I exaggerated that, that's a rigged game. When you have an impulse, a human body, a coyote's body, when you have an impulse that hits your brain, it takes three-tenths of one second for that electrical impulse to go through your muscle skeletal system and your muscles contract to react to that stimulus. Okay, I knew I could beat him every time. I gave him the 550 pants anyway. It's a great sport. Thank you a bunch. I appreciate that. Um, but I knew I could beat him because I'm, I'm already in motion. When this trap fires, when that animal steps on it, he has no reaction time. It takes him equally the same 0.3 seconds to react to stimulus time. <coughs> Excuse me. So there is that you, we just debunk the whole theory of, Oh, the coyote started, the, he fired the trap, but he, but he moved his foot out in, before the trap actually fired because he doesn't have time. When the trap's fired, the rest of what happens is strictly limited to the laws of physics. We take the coyote's response completely out of there because he ha does not have time to, uh, to get there. Um, only other thing, guys, we're real proud of our drags. We make a super, super aggressive drag. We call it ugly drag. I'll tell you the story real quick. Um, this is getting a little bit off trap modification. Oh, I want to finish with that real quickly. We modify body grips too. I know I don't have enough time to go completely back into the, all the modifications for our body grips, but real quickly, I want to do one quick demonstration here. We found that when we saw this system, and uh, we actually used 220s in uh, boxes. We're shooting at Bobcats with them, and uh, we, we were setting them just like you traditionally would, um, which is actually like that, right side up in front of a box. Uh, here again, we're real liberal laws in Mississippi. We actually could take a whole duck carcass, put in the back, not restricted by size or anything. We were catching the fire out of cats in this thing. And so I saw a similar, what I actually saw was a guy had a piece of angle iron in a, a Victor mousetrap, a wooden base mousetrap that he had right here. I said, hey, I can do that out of metal. I can cover the whole entire idea and the, I mean the whole entire width of the, of the, uh, the body grip. And so that's what we decided to do. We changed that system. Our cat numbers, we were already catching a lot of cats in those boxes. We tripled, tripled. I know that's a huge statement. We absolutely tripled our catch. What, and I didn't really think, I thought a bobcat and a raccoon was not afraid of anything. I thought they'd go through pretty much anything, push through. Not the case. Trigger avoidance was huge. I hate to make, to do this to you guys because this is going to be really, really painful. But I want you to look at my face. <laughs> that's the painful, painful part. And this is what you typically see right here. With, uh, with typical wire, sp wire spring triggers right here. That's typically what's hanging down. Now, um, keep that image in your, in your mind. Look at me again. Can you see how much more inviting and how much more open that is? Uh, trigger avoidance is a huge deal. Um, we like to say that one of the best ways to fix it is putting expander pans on body grips. But also, <clears throat> there's certain other things you can do for 
almost nothing. You can bend your springs completely horizontal. You can take the uh, corrugated plas uh, plastic like the campaign signs. You can slide those over. That's good for a uh, catch or two. You have to redo those with expander pans that last you, last you a lifetime. But here again, um, that's, uh, that's something that you, if you run body grips, it's something you can pay attention to. It'll definitely increase your catch right out of the, back, right out of the gate. Excuse me, and uh, that will that will help you for sure. Trigger avoidance. I had that lesson from we were already catching cats, but when we our numbers increased like they did, that was huge. Last thing is our ugly drags. I want to explain this real quick. I've had a lot of questions of why do you call it an ugly drag? And uh, so my son and I both own Expanded Pan together. He is now uh, 20 years old. How that happens, I don't know, because week before last, it seems like he was in diapers. But he runs the CNC machine as much as I do. And when we first made them, we, uh, we actually working with Jeb out of Oki Cable, and we cut Oki in here. Uh, Bailey, my son, came back, and he actually cut his initials in here. And I walked in the shop one day, and he's a, he's a smart kid, um, sometimes a smart aleck kid too, but he walked in, he never cracked a smile. He's got a real dry sense of humor. He says, oh, Dad, by the way, he said, uh, I made some drags back there for you to run your trap line. And I said, that's not like you. I said, what's up? Something's up. He said, by the way, I cut your initials in there. He said, I left them on the table. He gets in his truck and he goes to, to school. I come back and it says ugly on here. So, so that, that's the origin of the ugly drags. These things, uh, we're real proud of them. In clean dirt, we do a really good job tracking. You can follow that for a long ways. It marks up real good. In grass, we'll lock down that quick. There you go. Uh, any, kind, any kind of vegetation timber, I'm not going to... Uh, pull any of this down where these guys have, have done such a great job with super aggressive drag uh we're proud of them uh drags are a super cool tool um two years ago after a week of heavy setting and uh a trip to the doctor and diagnosis with tennis elbow and i'm a big old mississippi redneck and it hurt it hurt bad so that's why i decided to go to drags drags are a great tool if you can use them where you are you ought to think about them especially in the the coyote type situation fox type situation so really neat tool um, how are we doing on time, uh, Trent? Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great idea. One thing that we did uh, modifying these these uh, ugly drags, we decided to put a little key slot in here, and what that does will hold. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting the camera. Um, what we decided to do is, was cut this key slot, and what that will do, you can that's a receptacle for a DP trap. A DP will slide right in there. The benefit of that on the trap line, uh, here again, I'm primarily live market, but when we do jobs for uh, nest predation, uh, we, will, we will shoot at some raccoons as well. Uh, no longer do I have to find a limb. Where can I t anchor this thing off to? I have to get down there. I've got to twist wire. I've, I've got to put an extension cable around there. I can literally put the DP in here, have it already hooked up on my chain. I understand this is rope. Here's my coon trail right here. <clears throat> I'm gone. I'm set. That's, that's as long as it takes to set it. A lot of times I have those DPs pre-baited, pre preset, uh, and uh, come, it's literally laying down. Uh, I've actually got a little somewhat comical video on that same YouTube channel I was describing where I show um, actually having some pre-bait and dropping them by the window of the truck. So I, don't, I don't actually do that. That was uh, a little bit uh, comical, but that video is up there too. And, and uh, we, I actually did catch a, catch a raccoon, the one I dropped out of the truck on there, so on that video. So next question. Which, um, I have not timed that, and, you know, there's probably a mechanism. We could probably team up with somebody. I'm thinking of the pistol shooters, and they've got the nanosecond counters. Um, and I've not timed that. That's actually a really good question and one that uh, I probably should learn the answer to for, for demonstration purposes like we're doing right here. The best thing that I can tell you is it takes about that long. So, uh Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. This is far, is far less than three tenths of a second. That's a great question. It really and truly is. And I wish I had the exact, you know, the, I think it's going to vary from trap to trap, spring tension and all that. It's certainly beating three tenths of a second. A second really and truly is a long time. If you think about it, start one one thousand. That's, that takes a little while. That's a lot longer than throwing that trap. So, yeah. 
Any other questions anywhere? No more questions? Well, guys, uh, yes, sir. Pardon? I do. I'm a spray paint and dip guy. I've done the dye and wax thing before. I find the spray paint, and I use the Full Metal Jacket product. Uh, I have great luck out of that. Got a YouTube video on that, too, from Acid Bath Solution, where it's really a cool video. If you got nasty traps, you ought to check that video out, because it's uh, that acid bath that we use. You go to a trap that looks just like that 550 in a matter of about... 30 minutes uh, with very, very little effort. And then from there, I spray paint and dip. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do not use a pan cover. That is a permanent pan cover. The only thing that I do, sooner or later, I would learn to keep one of these set, wouldn't I? The only thing that I actually do, when I get the, the trap set and bedded, I know I'm getting real pushed for time here, I will take peat moss. And I literally, this is, this is my scoop. I've got a five-gallon bucket, and I trap out a little Japanese mini truck. I've got a five-gallon bucket that usually stays half full of peat moss. If you get more than that, just a sideline will blow out when you're going down the road. I grab one handful, whatever I can get right here. That's, that's the amount of peat moss I use. The trap's bedded. I'll boom. I'll drop it right there. I've got a little garden spade that's about six inches long. I will whisk right off the pan, left, right. All I'm trying to do, I, I fill this void right here. This, we're forced to leave this so the springs can actually operate and the jaws can operate. This pan is actually not sitting exactly square. Um, but all I'm doing is building a bridge right here. That's the only function that I'm using the peat moss for is to build a bridge so that when I sift back over with my sift dirt uh, or leaves or glass clippings or whatever I'm using, I'm not, getting any, I'm not allowing anything to get under the pan. The, pan, the trap can absolutely function right through, right through the uh, the peat moss, the peat moss, whatever does roll under the pan is not of the consistency that's going to interfere with that, the function of the pan. Where if I sifted, if I didn't do that and sifted straight dirt, I can build up some dirt right under the, that leading edge of the pan, if that makes any sense. Um, okay, guys, the last thing I want to mention, and I'm going to close this thing up. One thing that I've been really, really fortunate to do, and I'm shocked that so many people have not heard about it, um, occasionally, I have the honor to host Trapping Radio. A new episode comes out every single Friday night. It's a podcast that comes out 100% free of charge. I've learned volumes. It's taken my learning curve from, it's probably advanced me 20 years. Uh, on that podcast, um, we'll take a subject. It may be beavers. This time, we'll go through details of beaver trapping. We'll, next time, it may be coyotes. I have actually did an interview with Dave and Karen uh, Linkhart this this week at this Nationals, we talk about NTA. We talk about the function of NTA, what their position is. Extremely valuable information. If you're not aware of that, check it out. It's on demand. It's 270-some-odd episodes that are up there right now. TrappingRadio2.com. Uh, check it out. It will really help you out. So, guys, um, last thing, a hand for the guys that put this demo uh, station together. Is this not awesome? This is incredible. Y'all did a super, super job. Thank you so much. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you. We're in the main building, the right-hand side, the first alley on the left. If you have any questions, catch me at the booth. I'll be glad to answer them then. Thanks a bunch.